I'm Charles Shapiro. I'm the President of World Affairs Council of Atlanta. I want to thank all of you for spending some time with us. Um, I think it's great. If I'm going to invite you to turn on your, cam uh, your cameras right now, if, you, if you'd like. And we'd love to see you. Um, this program today was organized by Maddie Cook, and she's going to be the interviewer. Uh, Maddie is a trade commissioner at the Consulate General of Canada in Atlanta. Um, and last August, she brought to Atlanta Signe Schneider, um, who is our guest today. I'm delighted to have Signe here. Signe's in Ottawa, where she said it was snowing this morning. <laughs> nice. Um, and um, Signe is an expert on corporate social responsibility. So it's going to be really cool to to hear about CSR in the time of COVID, right? And so the official uh, topic is how to be a good corporate citizen in a pandemic. Um, and it's kind of interesting to see how lots of different businesses are stepping up. So, hey, Michael. So any, <laughs> anyhow, um, over, over to you, Maddie, and I'm gonna let you do the formal introduction. All right, thanks, Charles. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us here today on your lunch break. Yeah, you've got a reverberation. Is it gone now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I had a feeling I might have been causing that, but we're all good now. Um, so thank you, Charles, Ambassador Shapiro, for the introduction. I'm pleased to be hosting this today um, with the World Affairs Council, um, with, the, with the participation of my consulate, my, my employer, um, and thrilled to have Signe back here. Um, with the World Affairs Council virtually, um, kind of as a follow-up to our conference this past August, but you know what, follow-up to corporate social responsibility in a pandemic, because um, it's certain, the times have changed and um, we'd love to hear uh, Signe's insight on that. Um, just for the purposes of today, I just want to cue you to a few uh, vocabulary terms that might be useful. Um, corporate social responsibility will refer to often as CSR for shorthand and you'll hear a lot of different definitions discussed today but for the purposes and intents of this conversation CSR is whatever a company is doing that is to do good that is beyond what they are legally required to do. Um, so with that um, Charles provided a little bit of a, of, of a bio for Signe. Um, I'll provide a little more saying that she's a sustainability and ethics thought leader, having worked on everything from assessing the sustainability and ethics risks of billion dollar financing to writing one of the earliest human rights statements in the finance industry. A corporate social responsibility expert, CSR expert, she led one of the largest CSR departments in any financial institution. And during that time, she, her organization was named number one in the future 40 ranking of responsible corporate leaders in Canada. Uh, so with that, Signe, perhaps we can start the conversation with, um, you know, how's everything going in Canada? You're in a different country than the United States. What's, the, what's it like in Ottawa? Well, as I was saying to Ambassador Shapiro, there was a light sprinkling of snow this morning. So that's a little bit frustrating for everyone that's here. Um, but in terms of what's happening, you know, the vast majority of people that I know are working from home. Not all Canadians are, of course. We just passed 1,250 people dead from the pandemic. Um, I actually checked those numbers two days ago where it was 1,000, where that was a big, of course, milestone to be passed, but of course, it's gone up since then. Um, like the United States, one of the big issues here is long-term care homes. And in fact, that's accounting for about half the deaths that, are, that have taken place in Canada. Um, it's been a slow, steady trickle of cases here. Um, we've been, I would say, maybe eminently lucky. We haven't had any super spreading events, that kind of thing, which is good. Um, and we expect that we're going to, uh, we're in it for the long haul. There's been indications from government that uh, although some of our numbers are looking good, we're going to have to stay social distancing, physical distancing for quite a while. Should also mention, of course, that Canadians are watching the United States very closely. Um, Canada and the United States, it, probably all of you know this, but if you have a chance that you don't, it's the world's largest trading relationship between two countries. 
Um, there are many Canadians whose jobs rely on the United States, either through investment or relationship with American companies. And many Canadians have family in the United States. So everyone is watching very closely what's happening uh, in your country, as well as internationally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, from a CSR perspective, what are some of the things and trends you're seeing from Canadian and U.S. businesses? Yeah, so when we were thinking about, I, mean, I was thinking about this question. So I've been doing CSR for about 20 years, I would say. And when I first started off, it had a bit of a 1970s feel. You know, when companies would do something that was in the community investment space, or as it relates to environmental protections, going beyond what was legally required. Um, many cases, the activities were you know, thought up by one person within an organization, and then depending on their own steam and motivation and passion, it would go somewhere. And you saw some incredible things from that. In the last 20 years though, it's changed completely. So corporate social responsibility, we're talking about environmental and social sustainability, we're talking about anti-corruption, we're talking about um, environmental protections, we're talking about community investment. So that's the relationship that companies have with their communities, either locally, nationally, or internationally, if they have international operations. All of that has really changed in the last 20 years. So what have we seen? Uh, we've seen that this idea that, um, we've seen that there's a relationship now understood between social purpose and businesses, and that it's not that unusual to have a conversation with a business about what their role in the world is as it relates to social issues. And I mentioned that in part because in comparison, let's say to the 1970s and 60s, that's very unusual. It's something that has very much uh, become common in these last couple decades, but wasn't something that was there before. Profit maximization, you were a company, you uh, took care of your business, and generally people didn't ask you about social ills, for example, or big picture questions, unless you were directly tied to it. The other effect of this idea that corporations are no longer separate from society is that we see with the millennial generation and Generation Y is that they take very seriously where it is that they work. If they have the privilege and ability to make choices around where they choose jobs, they want to know about the social purpose of the company, what programs are in place, uh, anything from is there an adequate enough recycling within the office to what kind of work they're doing, how they're dealing with big uh, corporate issues. Now that dinner time conversation that may have taken place in the past where you weren't necessarily asked about where you work, now at dinner, at these dinner parties, you go to, you're asked where you work, and then you're ex expected to defend the organization or explain why it is that you're working there, especially if they've mm -hmm. been in the news. So that's something that's pretty unusual and new in the last uh, two decades. The other thing I would say is there's just been a sheer professionalization of the space. So whereas in the past, you could be the one CSR person in an organization or one CSR consultant in the area. And now those roles just don't really exist. Of course, climate change is one of the big ones where there's been an exceptional level of professionalization, in part because uh, understanding your company's supply chain and your company's relationship to climate change and climate risk is so very complex in many cases. Um, mm -hmm. But also because we've seen a lot more programming that's data-driven. So an example here would be community investment programs where instead of it just being something that one CEO, that the, the CEO thought of it, or maybe a board member had a relationship with a voluntary organization and said, we should have some sort of relationship uh, with this organization, that's changed. So now in community investment, there's conversations around what kind of relationships with our community partners make the most sense for who we are as an organization, which is really from ad hoc to strategic and planned. And then of course, board and CEO engagement. Um, you generally did not have a um, report that would go up to board level on CSR matters. It might have come as part of a marketing report or maybe a government relations report, excuse me. Um, but now you see in many of these cases, these groups are single teams um, that are sitting within, let's say a larger risk management group and the board and a CEO wants to have real input and have real conversations around these kinds of matters. 
So that's a sea change from now versus let's say when I started and very significant in comparison to the two decades before that. Interesting. So this past summer when you were at Atlanta as the keynote presenter at CARE this past summer, you alluded to what CSR might look like in 2040. Do you think that's now fast tracked with COVID-19? So this past summer, I talked about a couple things that I said, you know, CSR in 2040, this is what I expect it to look like. I said digitalization, that if you were a company, you thought of yourself as a forestry company or a services company um, or manufacturing, that by 2040, you will also think of yourself as a digital company. Well, clearly, I mean, that's happening now. That's been so incredibly fast tracked. Uh, mm -hmm. It's almost stunning. The, one of the points I was making about uh, the importance of thinking about yourself as a digital company now was the fact that you were going to have to, as an organization, figure out your plans um, regarding privacy. What kind of privacy policy were you going to put together? What was going to be your approach to privacy? As you gather all this data from your clients, from your suppliers, how are you going to treat that? Are you going to monetize it? Are you going to uh, manipulate it for, uh, for further targeting? What's going to be your ethical parameters around that? So now all of a sudden we have companies that really didn't have much of an internet presence doing online sales, dropping off at people's doorsteps. Um, so that's on the small business side. And then of course on the large, large business side, you know, your Walmarts who've gone from people going in and looking, going to the shelves and getting what they need to porch pick, no, well, porch pickup, a curbside pickup. I mean, that's a huge amount of data that is now within those organizations. Mm -hmm. So anyone in those organizations who were putting up their hand and saying, you know, I think we need to think about how we're going to treat these, uh, all this data that we will have ethically, they're going to have to put their hand up again. It's one of those fast things. Um, I would also say one of the things I talked about in the past, this past summer, and this is very kind of CSR specific. So for those of you who don't have a CSR background, what generally happens is um, a company, an organization decides to start having um, a CSR program of some form. Maybe it's a little bit of community investment, maybe they're measuring their environmental footprint, but one of the first things that they'll do is they'll start producing a CSR report or a sustainability report. And generally best practice is that that report is done to global reporting initiative levels, GRI, that's the most common at this moment, but there's others out there. And those reports, um, the GRI requires you to give data on a whole set of data points. Um, but generally what happens in the sustainability reports, CSR reports, is for the most part, companies kind of talk about the issues that they're interested in and they speak to the stakeholders that they have a relationship with. So an example here would be, very often a company will produce a CSR report and then they'll pull in a group of stakeholders to review that CSR report and give them feedback. Mm -hmm. But it's generally people that they have a relationship with. And so I was saying in 2040, I thought that we wouldn't have that luxury any longer. That in 2040, the issues would find you and the stakeholders would find you. Instead of kind of picking and choosing who would be your inputs as it relates to bigger issues, that the gloves would be off. Um, and I think we're seeing that right now. The economic dislocation that's taking place due to the pandemic is making it so that whereas employees may have been one stakeholder group, maybe amongst others seem to be kind of equivalent, employees have just shot up in terms of the importance for uh, organizations in terms of thinking about their stakeholders, Amazon yeah. being a perfect example right now. Um, but debates about CEO pay and what's an appropriate amount for a CEO to be paid when you have a whole bunch of layoffs. So in the, in the global reporting initiative and some of those other um, reporting mechanisms, you often have to state what the, what the uh, magnitude is between your lowest paid employee and your highest paid employee, generally the CEO. And, but for the most part, there generally isn't a lot of conversation around that. But of course, what's happening now is everyone's saying, well, hold on, not to pick on Jeff Bezos, but you know, he made 34 billion or whatever it was this past week because the stock went up. Um, mm -hmm. but here, this this other issue happening with Amazon employees. Uh, so that's when we see. And 
big one, which had not been part of the big conversation around uh, CSR generally, uh, worker protection, uh, personal protection equipment. Mm -hmm. um, there was an idea in the past that what you were paid and the risks that you took, took on were, were equated somehow. You know, so people would often, I remember when I was in high school, keep, keep on, people kept on saying that uh, you should become an underwater welder. It was something that paid a lot. <laughs> you know, it had the risk, but it paid a lot and it was worth. But what right. we're seeing is that this um, risk and reward connection with the pandemic, they don't match up. So we have a whole group of massive swaths of individuals who have high risk or in, are in high risk circumstances, be they uh, garbage men to nurses to personal support workers, PSWs, who do not get the pay that theoretically should come along with the risk that they're taking. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last one I would say in this, in terms of companies no longer being able to pick and choose kind of how they handle the CSR matters that come through the door, uh, flexible work arrangements. So working from home, fantastic, wonderful um, arrangement. And now this conversation is about, okay, everybody in our group, in our team is working from home, but can everybody actually put in full-time hours? You don't know what's happening in your employees' lives at home. You don't know they're taking care of children, they're taking care of parents, they've got other things going on. Uh, where are we seeing companies saying, yes, we've, we have you working from home, but that was only step one. One of the examples I heard um, was of, to think of the name of the company, um, who has decided to pay their employees, their full-time employees, full-time salaries but understand that they may be working or they are working part-time. So this idea, that, um, uh, this idea that you can be working from home right now and being as fully productive as you were before, well, that is going to disadvantage a whole bunch of vulnerable groups. It's going to advantage parents who are single parenting. Mm -hmm. It's going to uh, disadvantage individuals who have a big, uh, significant personal load in their life that you may not know about. So this idea in the CSR world it kind of has been a bit um, that you could pick and choose how you talked about your shoes and what you chose to bring forward. And I think this is, is really pushing that to the end. Now, I'll talk about one last one. And I don't know what's going to happen with this area. But what we're seeing is the fast tracking of a lot of decisions. And in many organizations, to make a decision, you have to go through multiple approvals. So you have to go through a risk management process, you've got a compliance team what is this going to mean going forward? We're going to have a period of time where decisions are being made very quickly. I don't know if some risk uh, parameters are being dropped and that's why they can go so quick. I don't know if the risk teams are just working insane hours. So I don't know what the data is on that. But as we get back to normal, whatever normal is going to look like, those risk management and compliance teams are going to want to take a have a conversation amongst themselves not about how to justify their existence, but how to explain which risk parameters need to be put back in because the organization will have lived without them for a while and probably felt like um, they were doing fine without it. It's a really interesting dynamic from the perspective of compliance groups often have to, quite, they have to fight quite hard to get things in place. And that there's the potential that that's been really pulled back. Again, though, I don't know what the data is, this is just me looking at how fast some decisions have been made in some organizations. Right. And prioritizing those decisions on like, is this decision we have to make for the continuation of our business right now as it is, or like anticipating when it turns back to normal, are they, are companies anticipating certain groups that are affected more, certain communities affected more by the pandemic to be coming forward or anticipating putting down policies for stronger diversity initiatives? Do you think that's a conversation now or it's just not the right time? Um, wait, ask me the question again, just so I make sure I understand. So do you think there's a, a sense of anticipation from CSR departments, CEOs, in that they're expecting to adjust their CSR policies upon returning to the new normal? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and probably one for input on the chat function, for example, for those who are working in that area. Of course, nobody wants to talk about their own personal um, workplace, but you know, when I'll be honest, uh, the nature of CSR type work um, 
can be such that some um, roadblocks, well, let me rephrase. Sometimes what I've seen in organizations is that the CSR function, be that whoever it be, or, or whatever title that they have, um, sometimes you see that they touch every single decision or they want input in every single decision. And from a process perspective, that might not be necessary. So um, for example, and, and in many cases, companies don't actually have a CSR department, but they have one member of the C-suite, for example, who considers themselves the conscience of the organization. So what takes place there? Sometimes uh, they wanna see everything, and so they are a bottleneck. And sometimes it's because uh, an organization hasn't figured out what its values are. So you, sometimes you have a values conflict and then that can cause CSR groups or environmental uh, assessment groups or others to need to see everything because they feel like they need to adjudicate. Mm -hmm. And then other times you see it as a kind of slowing down mechanism. So sometimes you see this at the CEO level where the CEO wants to see everything because he or she can't figure out um, a clear enough vision that they can let go. So you see that in, let's say, smaller and medium-sized organizations. Um, and then sometimes you just have poor early vetting. So this, a classic here would be um, where, let's say you're looking at community partnerships. If you haven't set out the parameters for those partners, what you wanna see, then you generally end up having somebody somewhere down the line that wants to see every partnership and do his own or, or her own evaluation. So if a CSR group or the CSR type folks in an organization know that, they maybe should go off and think and do some self-reflection. When we're looking for input, what's the intent? And can we fix the process issue? Uh, because we're gonna have to potentially make a big argument for why we should be involved in everything going forward, given how speedy everything's been done up to now. Mm -hmm. So kind of skipping ahead here, um, you know, we're all going through different and similar experiences at the same time. I can imagine that for many of the folks tuning in today, CSR is important to them as an individual or as a company. For those of us who have found ourselves searching for a new job, what might we want to ask a potential employer about their CSR policies and inquire about their COVID-19 response? Sure. So the obvious question, and you've seen this so much on Twitter and Facebook, and everyone's saying that the next time they go for a job interview, the first question they're gonna ask is, what arrangements did you make for your employees through COVID-19? I mean, it is an excellent uh, litmus test of leadership, of strategy, of, of responsiveness, all of that, absolutely. Um, if I were sitting in front of someone new and I was, and, and let's assume this is an office job, and let's assume that I have the ability to ask these questions. I'm in some sort of reciprocal power relationship where I feel like I can ask these questions. Um, I would ask them about their diversity and inclusion data. Uh, diversity and inclusion, we know that there's a relationship between that and the resilience of companies. Asking about the data both signals that it's important to you, and so I suggest that everyone ask those questions. Uh, not just if you're from a marginalized group, for example, everyone should be asking. Mm -hmm. um, you should ask. The other thing I would ask, and this is an interesting dynamic, um, but I might ask, how has your organization, what, have you, what has your organization done to move from a management style of bums in seats to management by objectives? And the reason that I say that is, one of the things that we know from this pandemic is that people, again, have um, a multitude of things going on in their, in their lives. And vulnerable groups in particular have um, things that make, uh, can make work more complex. So in a lot of traditional office environments, um, you are graded by how much face time you have with your boss or your ability to put out fires late, you know, uh, late in the evening, you know, your ability to work a lot of overtime. Um, in some cases, these are absolutely legit legitimate, but in many cases, it's a sign that the management style is still focused on seeing somebody face to face and feeling like, because I can see that person, I, I, I can see their contribution. 
future, and you see this in the software industry, but you, I mean, this is a real challenge to make this uh, conversion, uh, but converting over to management by objectives means that for many individuals, you can have much more predictability. It's very hard for a single parent, for example, to all of a sudden have to pull a late Friday night. They have to have a network of people around them that can step in on those circumstances. And I mentioned this, I mean, this doesn't maybe feel very CSR-like, mm -hmm. uh, but what we're seeing because of the pandemic, because it is affecting different groups in different ways, um, the, the asking that kind of question around this bums and seeds versus management by objectives should start to give you clues to how the organization values its employees and what they value from them. So uh, sick days, you know, sick days, leave policies, you know, we're gonna, probably gonna be in this for quite a while. Let's say we're still dealing with outbreaks, you know, over the next 18 months. You know, uh, organ organizations that require a doctor's note or, or require you in some cases, this has got to change, but in some cases require you to test positive before you can have sick leave. I mean, mm -hmm. these are all, um, I think these will, in some, some of those cases, we won't see that, uh, we'll see that go away fairly quickly. And, uh, and, you know, I feel badly for the HR folks because the HR folks, they need some predictability. And so that's why you have HR policies, but you've got so much change taking place right now, so many people impacted, and a lot of systems, both in terms of leadership and management and in terms of HR, that assumes, let's say, a steady home life, that assumes ability for people to pick up your kids when you can't get home. And really, if we want to have a diverse and inclusive workplace, and I'm not a diversion, uh, diversity and uh, inclusiveness expert, but the, the tie-in on the CSR side is so clear, you, you need to ask those questions. And the last one I would say, you may feel like climate change uh, doesn't matter as much because we're going to be going through this big issue, because we're going through this big um, economic event and, and social event, climate resiliency. Um, in many cases, the effects of climate change that we see going forward, um, the kinds of responses that companies have right now will give you a sense of whether or not they're prepared for going forward. And People are going to be retooling, pivoting, new product lines. This is a great time to have that climate resiliency conversation. Now's a good time to get used to change, huh? Yeah. So I've got one more question before we move to Q&A. So folks, if you have a question, feel free to type in on your Zoom account on the chat and I'll read those off. Um, so last question before I pivot there. So you know, kind of on along the lines of your environmental comments, there's clearly company incentive these days to market themselves as good, good corporate citizens, but some may argue the bigger and more dangerous current threat right now is climate change. In this time for CSR, how can we raise the bar for how corporations should respond? Oh, that's a great question. Um, If you take, um, let me think, let me think about this. How should we raise the bar in relation to the climate change side while we're going, good corporate citizen? Um, maybe what I would say, and this is gonna go a little bit away from this, but come back to it. Um, if you're a CEO right now, who do you need to have around you? It's not unusual in times of stress for, um, for individuals to go back to their areas of comfort. And I mentioned that because I was thinking about if I were a CEO, what, what's the group of people I'd like to have around me to respond to issues, mm -hmm. right? And so you wanna have you know, your head of legal, you wanna have your head of government relations, let's say, you want to have your head of public relations or marketing or whatever that external communications function is. You want to have them all around. But you want to have the kind of relationship with them um, so that you can say, take off that technical hat and let's have a conversation about what's the right thing to do here. And then I want you to put your hat back on and we'll go through whether or not from a legal perspective, this is a good idea. You know, does it, what does it do from a government relations, from a public relations perspective? 
I think the same dynamic is that around that table, if you can have someone that has um, some expertise in climate risk and what climate risk is going to mean for your organization, that would be useful. You want people speaking first and foremost from the perspective of what is the right thing to do and then put those hats on. But if you don't have those climate risk people around the table, you won't have, uh, you won't, you won't be getting that input. The low carbon economy is going to have huge, huge opportunities for so many companies, huge opportunities. It's getting through that transition. And on top of it, this is the period of time to have a strategy session with those folks that says, what might the next two years look like, not just the next you know, six weeks. We're seeing um, protectionism increase. We're seeing big issues with supply chains. Uh, we're going to, I mean, how is the live entertainment industry going to respond? The tourism industry going to respond? Mm -hmm. This is a very difficult time. And if you have those strategic conversations, I think you should over Zoom or Google Hangouts or whatever it is with your group, give yourself the opportunity to see something positive coming from all this change if you can make it through this next bit. Thank you. So my face might go off the screen for a second, but I'm going to log in or find the chat. We've got some questions. All right, so from Charles Shapiro, what are the most innovative actions taken by a Canadian company in response to COVID? Hmm. Oh, there's been so many good stories. Um, that's been really, really outstanding. Uh, I'll just tell a, a few stories from the Ottawa area. Um, uh, Export Development Canada, who I used to work for, in, has been very clear with their employees um, how long they expect um, employees to be home. So they have given very good indications saying early on, we not, not, not as, as to when they think that we're all going to be let out, but saying, we're going to tell you now that we expect you to be working from home until June 30th. And so a really high level of predictability and creating budget within their budgets for people to upgrade their home offices. I mean, that's wonderful. And it's so simple, but it's so straightforward. Everyone that's going to be doing Zoom, uh, Google Hangouts, et cetera, you're sitting in front of your computer nonstop. You don't get to get up, ergonomic chair, whatever, uh, good camera, fantastic. Um, it's been really interesting to see how certain companies have been able to pivot in terms of their production lines. Um, the, one of the local ones here is a, um, a dairy that's a vodka producer. So it sounds a bit strange. It's vodka. It's it's a dairy based <laughs> vodka. It's, it's, it's vodka, but it comes from cows. I don't really understand how it works. But of course, they like everyone else have, have switched over to hand sanitizing, mm -hmm. right, which it was a big shortage of hand sanitizer here in Ottawa. Absolutely. Um, I volunteer at a hospital. And the volunteers work is uh, the kind of work that I do and that others do is mostly to sit with the patients um, provide them comfort, help them do their laundry, um, help them write letters, that kind of thing. And the individuals who work in the hospital whose work is not absolutely essential right now are being switched over to doing that patient care. Mm. Because of course the patients can't have family and friends um, to come visit them and family and friends make a big difference in terms of they, they do so much personal care for these patients. Um, other exciting things that we've seen, the communications out of um, uh, the Loblaws group, which is Galen Weston, so that's one of our largest grocery stores, has been very good. It's been um, straightforward. It comes across very authentic. Um, they've had, every time you go into a Loblaws, they have increased their social distancing measures. So there's been a ton of change on their side, but their communications have been very, very strong. In many cases there, we are seeing um, a honeymoon period for companies right now where they do something nice and everyone's like, oh, that's wonderful. And it's making it on Twitter and Facebook. And that is going to end, you know, heads up companies, that is going to end. But small things that are being done by companies right now, um, they are getting the recognition for it and it feels genuine. Um, 
companies that are doing things that don't seem genuine, it'll be called out very quickly. I mean, this is the time to increase the pay of your communication staff <laughs> in that sense. Uh, but again, I say that's not going to stick. We are going to see people being much tougher on, um, on companies in terms of what they've done, especially when it comes to whether or not they truly need to lay people off, which initially kind of in here, we had lots of layoffs and then actually a government, um, uh, government top up uh, $2,000 per month for individuals very quickly uh, went into their bank accounts. Um, but those longer questions as to, did you really need to make those choices, I think are gonna be tough ones for some companies. Mm -hmm. Especially when everyone's on a device at home, so close to social media right now. Yeah, I think like most of us are up to 17 hours per day on the internet, what? <laughs> <laughs> so another question from the audience. Uh, comes from Consul General Nadia Theodore. We always underscore that leadership isn't only about actions of the C-suite. All levels of the org should be demonstrating leadership. So what can you do in the era of COVID if you are not a C-suite employee or manager to demonstrate leadership in this time? And kudos for underscoring that discussion about diversity, equity, and inclusion should be everyone's issue. Yeah, I would uh, suggest one website that people can go and check out. It's catalyst.org. It's um, a great organization for the empowerment of women at work, and they have very practical tips around things. So one of the things that they've put out in the last couple of days is a survey that you can use with your staff that give you a better sense of what's happening for your staff. And I mentioned that, um, so if you're not C-suite, you know, you're not sitting strategy on the go, but you may feel, again, like you know exactly what's happening with your employees. You have a close relationship with them. Um, but generally, that is, you don't, don't fall in the trap of thinking that you know what's happening with your staff. Um, they may, there may be things that they're not telling you about. Uh, there may be things that they're looking for the opportunity that's not, but they haven't found it yet. So making assumptions, for example, about their mental health, making assumptions about the amount of time that they have, uh, to contribute to work, that kind of thing. So when you see um, organizations doing things, and so this would happen at uh, the, you know, a director or team, team lead, you know, one, absolutely showing yourself, you know, the ability, showing, pushing back on higher levels when glass minute requests come in, um, being very clear about your weekends being your own, uh, being very clear about uh, your intention not to come into the office until you're comfortable. So we do have a HR issue that's probably going to come forward uh, at some point in time where individuals may bring forward, for example, human rights complaints saying, I was told to go back to work and I was not comfortable, or I wasn't even told, but it was, you know, suggested to me. Middle managers uh, start thinking about now how you can communicate your um, how you can communicate your intentions in a way that allows you to have honest and open conversations with your staff because you never want to be in a circumstance where you're putting a person in a bind where they feel like they're having to choose between their own health and safety and their job. Um, and that can happen. And everyone's own uh, risk profile, risk tolerance is, is very different. So not making assumptions about that. So there are some resources out there to either put out surveys to your group, um, uh, putting surveys out to your group, having conversations. In terms of non-managers, or maybe you're the, uh, the guru on your team, I mean, again, modeling the behaviors, um, you often will have much greater insight to some of the team members than your, than your boss will. Um, so absolutely looking into that. And then, you know, maybe somebody needs to put up their hand and say, our year, our, our annual goals for 2020 are not realistic any longer. And I'd like to have a conversation about changing those goals and adjusting them sooner than later because they are causing me anxiety. And then the others on the team need to applaud that person. They need to say, thank you for bringing that up. They need to uh, provide support uh, to un individuals who are saying, I'm scared, uh, I'm anxious, I need help. Um, and, and making them feel that that's something that they can do It's that kind of team environment. Sounds like a lot of boundary setting, just from like a personal point of view. 
Absolutely. I think that maybe the next World Council conversation is to bring in like someone who's very good at boundaries in terms of how to set them within the workplace, et cetera. I mean, we're just in such uncertain times. Yeah. And, and I'll be honest, my experience as a leader and my experience as a manager and as a vice president, I have made mistakes thinking my relationship with my employees was intimate to the level that I would know when they were having issues, that I would know that uh, something was going on in their life. And every leader at some point in time has that humbling experience of someone coming to them and saying, you know, you may have noticed I've been having a hard time when you didn't notice at all. <laughs> so don't, don't, it, it's very common, it's very human. Don't, uh, don't believe that you have the greatest insight of all time. It's not something, it's, that's, that's a superhero complex. Mm -hmm. What's the best, I mean, we mentioned earlier in the conversation that decisions have to be made so quickly right now. And there might, there's, there's definitely instances when we make the wrong decision. What's the best way to apologize and, you know, redo, do it right for the CSR record? <laughs> um, so as it relates to leadership, I'll leave that up to the leadership experts, et cetera. As it relates to CSR, um, yes. So let's say uh, a, a great example here would be um, you're, we're in the midst of this um, crisis and one of your colleagues comes up with an idea, we should form a partnership with um, this particular group that uh, works with the homeless, for example. Um, and we will give them these things. We will give them these things. We have a lot of this in our inventory and we will give them that because we think that that's what they need. So one of the greatest phrases that I've heard to always keep, you know, you should put it up on, this, on your wall, nothing about us without us. So nothing, so I, I, I heard it at a, a United Nations um, Sustainable Development Goals, and it was a uh, person who was a leader of a vulnerable group. Um, it, they were a First Nations person here in Canada, and they said, nothing about us without us. Do not decide about some sort of initiative or activity that you're going to do to us or with us without us. We are the ones who are the best at understanding what it is that we need. Hmm. And it can be very easily in these moments of speed uh, to be like, oh my gosh, we have this stuff, we should give it to them. You know, ask first, what do they need? Check on that, don't be offended if it doesn't work for them. You know, if they're like, nope, no thanks, we don't want that, that arrangement. Putting your ego aside is hard. Um, and remembering that you do not know what others need, um, that is a big one. And that is a consistent mistake that's made. It's a very human mistake. Um, in that circumstance, you just say, you know what? In our enthusiasm to contribute, we jumped ahead and we didn't think through what input you might wanna have, or we didn't think through about getting your voice early on. If you have gone public, um, a good communications team, we have seen that honest uh, acknowledgement um, has been very successful. Um, people who are public relations experts will know this, uh, know this area better, but I've seen a number of organizations make apologies and say, we, um, we had a, our judgment wasn't great. And if we were to do this again, we wouldn't do it that way. End of story, move on, um, and acknowledges that you know that you're not um, invincible. So, and ideally what we do is we continue to give companies some of this benefit of the doubt. They are, companies are made up of uh, groups of humans and humans uh, make mistakes. Um, so figure out, you know, your own personal approach to an organization when it makes a mistake, how forgiving you're gonna be because they are fallible and uh, they're not perfect. Okay, we got another question. For someone who works in nonprofit in a third world country that's known as one of the wealthiest countries in the world because of its natural resources, we see large American and Canadian companies doing business in communities, mostly in the mining, construction, and manufacturing sectors. These foreign companies are not doing enough in these communities in the CSR space compared to the millions of dollars they make. What would be the best way to approach and challenge these companies to invest more in these communities? That's a really uh, interesting question. So just a little bit of history. Um, 
the mining companies and the oil and gas companies were some of the first companies to make the big mistakes around doing community investment projects that they thought people needed versus having conversations with the, uh, uh, the local communities. So best practice in the mining world, for example, uh, very best practice is way before you put any kind of shovels in the ground, you, you know, send anthropologists and sociologists, send people who are technically trained to work with communities to understand their needs. There's a beautiful community mapping process that can take place where instead of seeing the natural resources through the eyes of an external person, you know, the ores here, the water bodies there, um, to do a mapping system that'll tell you that, for example, the um, uh, community has uh, honeybees um, that's part of their livelihood and the honeybees are over here, which means that they're gonna have to go through the mine site on a regular basis. There's tons of um, expertise out there, uh, tools, systems, the IFC performance standards are one set that uh, that's the World Bank set of standards for how companies should act under these circumstances, the kinds of things that they should do. I think the question that you're getting at is, it's one thing to see in my backyard a whole bunch of people who are laid off when I know that that company uh, is making a ton of money and it feels like a real disparity. It's another thing when it's, you take that and you times it by what feels like a hundred where you know, um, you're seeing that mining company X is, um, their, their stock is trading incredibly well and you hear stories about the workers um, being put in work camps where they don't have adequate protection against each other. So we just had in Canada the first beginnings of the potential of an outbreak in a uh, workers camp in, up in the oil sands. Um, I expect that we'll see outbreaks of COVID-19 through many uh, worker sites. Remember in the case of mining, uh, generally they're fly in, fly out. They're in there for a couple of weeks. The, there are international standards around how much space should be for, between beds, for example, in, ter in terms of the workers' bunks and things like that, but not everybody meets them. And those probably don't, um, they're not applicable any longer in, the, uh, in this, in this COVID-19 world. Um, how do you respond to them? It's gonna sound really boring, but one of the best ways to pressure companies is to ask to see um, what their policies are, um, whether or not they have third party audits of the work that they've done. If they state that they do X, Y, and Z, is there evidence of that? Um, that is, it's, it's gonna sound funny, but that actually in many cases holds their feet to the fire more so than a, how can you be doing business in this low governance state overseas? Um, they need to meet international standards and they need to have external validation that they are meeting those in international standards and um, pushing them in that direction is the way that you get consistent behavior. I will say something else. It's a little bit on the political side. Um, people that are worried about the activities of corporate players overseas, you can also make choices around your voting patterns. Um, we forget that sometimes that making choices in terms of who you send to uh, Congress or the Senate um, can make a difference in terms of standards that are enacted and um, or, or to the go uh, gubernatorial race, standards that are enacted and, and companies are held to. That was a whole like roundabout answer. Good question. I actually don't know the answer. That was my best attempt. <laughs> so we've got one more question before we wrap up for today. Um, another question from the audience. Does the response you're seeing from governments, corporations, other leaders in other areas, does it give you hope that we'll be able to kind of unite against, um, you know, the future and be better prepared for maybe another pandemic? Because there probably will be one. Um, <laughs> so I'll just talk about the Canadian experience. Um, what we have seen in this first, I would say, month and a half was a fairly exceptional level of cooperation between the federal level of government and the provincial level of government. So our equivalent of federal and state. Um, people who, politicians who were particularly partisan, um, saying very nice things about uh, other levels of government and members of other parties. 
Um, one of two of them talked publicly about how much they're relying on each other for talking through really difficult issues and keeping their stress levels from being overwhelming. So that is pretty amazing um, and a really nice thing to see. Um, we do know from studies that in times of crisis, you don't necessarily see social dislocation. You see a pulling together of people, um, which is incredible. Um, and you want to keep that up. Um, do I think that we can get through another thing? Another, it depends on what your baseline, you know, is for, for what, what's okay. There are a lot of things that are happening within this pandemic that aren't okay. Um, there's a lot of beautiful things and a lot of really neat things that are taking place. Um, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I would be interested to hear what uh, this group, this audience feels, how they feel about it. Now, you work in the CSR space, it has um, a blessing and a fault. If you work in the CSR space, the blessing is that you get to do things about difficult issues. The downside is that you really are a person who, who consumes a lot of really difficult media. Um, and that those two things go together. So I, I am excited. I feel like we're, we're, this is an exciting time. As much as you can say that, this is a time where people are pulling yeah. together. And I think some companies are doing some amazing things and setting such a great, such a great, um, um, they're such a great model. Um, but I can't say that without acknowledging just the sheer um, devastation and pain and loss and grief that everybody is feeling, which we probably should have started out with. We probably should have started off made and be saying, and Ambassador Shapiro, we probably should have said, you know, we need to take a moment to acknowledge uh, how tough this has been uh, and how tough it continues to be for so many. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um... This has been terrific. And man, I hope I'm unmuted. Can y'all hear me? We hear you. Good. Um, Signe, thank you so much. This has been great. And you're right, we should have taken a moment at the beginning. And so you talk about how to apologize. This is the time to apologize. Talk about, I mean, there's so many people who are having to deal with so many issues right now. Um, you know, those of us who are working remote from home, you know, really quite blessed. To, to have the luxury of doing that and getting for doing that when there's so many other people who are both suffering directly from COVID, but loads of other people are, you know, got to do the jobs, got to be working at Loblaws or wherever it is at supermarkets and delivering the food to our front porches and, uh, you know, doing the, the, the people working in hospitals. I mean, God bless them. That's just... And we do, we do need to talk about that more. Signe, it's been great. Uh, I, I love the phrase, nothing about us without us. Um, I, I like that. It's, that's been very, very cool. This has been a really interesting 45 minutes. I got to do a little advertisement here. Got three programs coming up next week, which you do not want to miss. And I'm going to read this because I've got, I'll screw it up if I don't. Is on Tuesday, we've got a members forum. Um, that's on COVID. This is, if you don't want to talk about COVID, but you want to talk about the, the ordinary death and destruction of life um, that, that the World Affairs Council members love to talk about, we've got a program on covert military operations versus legality of operations. We've got two experts, Dr. Laurie Blank from Emory University and Dr. Carrie Lee from the National War College, who we've had um, at another program and she, she is just fabulous. So that's Tuesday, April 21st. On Wednesday, the 22nd, we've got Jimmy Story, who is the charge at the U.S. Embassy to Venezuela, which is actually a virtual embassy. It's actually located in Bogota, Colombia, uh, talking about, among other things, how does a country whose health system is absolutely collapsed uh, whose economy has failed? How do they? How did they deal with COVID? So this that's going to be super interesting. And then on Thursday, April twenty third, um, we've got David Rennie, who's the Economist Magazine's chief correspondent in Beijing. 
Um, so he's at the epicenter of the COVID crisis. How did China handle this? How's China handling it now? How's it taking advantage of what's going on when they seem to have come out the other side? Is that real? Is it not? That's going to be terrific. So I'm going to urge all of you to please um, spend some more time with us. So that's next Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I want to thank Maddie for organizing this. I want to thank the Consulate General of Canada for putting this on together with us. Thank you, Nadia Theodore. Thank you for the terrific question. Um, and I want to thank the UPS Foundation, which in part has sponsored this today. It's in part because the rest of our support comes from our members like you. And so thank you all the members of the World Affairs Council. Um, it's your support that allows us to keep going without doing the sorts of programs, the in-person programs that we've been doing for the last 10 years. If you're not a member, please join. If you're able, um, we'd be delighted if you go to our website and, and make a donation so we can do more of these because this, this is, uh, it's stressing and challenging our organization just like everybody else's. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Signe, once again, thanks. This is great. I hope you get spring in Ottawa someday. Um, now you jinxed it. <laughs> oh, oops. Sorry, I said that. Uh, Maddie, thank you. You've done a great job as moderator. I think you're going to take my job from me. So I, I appreciate it. It's been pretty cool. <laughs> my thank pleasure. you, everybody. Thank you, Signe. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Bye, y'all. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.